Good afternoon and welcome to our return of geopolitics webinar. You're very welcome uh, to join us at the Institute of International and European Affairs. My name is Dan O'Brien. It's a pleasure to be joined by three fantastic speakers to discuss this topic uh, this afternoon. Uh, for our first speaker will be Vice Admiral Mark Mellish, who's just, just retired as the Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces. Uh, from London, we have Dr Ulrike Franke, who is a senior uh, policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And from Washington, D.C., we have Dr. Thomas Wright, who's director of the Center of, on the United States in Europe and a senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy at Brookings Institute. You're all welcome uh, to join us this afternoon. Uh, many thanks for, for coming and contributing. And without further ado, uh, Mark, could I ask you to open for us, please? OK, just um, a thumbs up if you see me there or you can hear me. Okay, I, I suppose the, I'd like to approach it just from three points as to where we've come from, where we are and where we're going. And um, the one thing I would say about Europe in particular um, and is the remarkable peace we've had for uh, over 75 years. And that's built not just on the work of Robert Schuman and um, the development of the economic security out of the EC into the EU, but it was also developed by our relationship with the US and initiatives in terms of the Marshall Plan and the EU recovery program after the Second World War. And the continued interest of US in Europe was significant for that 75 years, notwithstanding the fact that we've had the Balkan Wars and the fallout from that. But things are changing on that side. And um, I think a number of about two decades, three decades ago, Europe was 25% of um, global wealth in about 20 years time, we'll be down to just over 10%. And that means the powers are, are, are changing. I think the second piece that is um, changing in context of where we are now is the actual um, shift in US interest in the context of um, uh, multilateralism. And in particular, during the Trump administration, the, I suppose, rising evidence of unilateralism and a, a disengagement from Europe and the penalties associated with that. To some degree, some recovery since the Biden administration, but nevertheless, signals were sent from that. Um, I think the third uh, reality is the um, where we are at present is a general decline in global peace and security. According to the Global Peace Index, we had that decline over the last 10 years. And we just look around Europe at present, we have three war, wars on our borders, the Ukraine war, which I'm sure we're going to talk a full scale hybrid war, which um, I think the UN have an underwritten estimates of 14,000 dead in that. And now we have to build up in terms of Russia on the border of Ukraine. We've had the um, multi proxy wars in uh, Syria, and they still rumble on to uh, some degree. We have the civil war in uh, Libya, which um, is in a stalemate. And that's not to mention uh, the instability across uh, Africa, in particular across the Sahel, uh, in areas like the tri border area of Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali. We also have, I suppose, the, um, the change in economic landscape. And that's, uh, I think, the, the biggest indicator of the power shifts, which um, the Belt and Road Initiative in terms of China, it's, uh, I suppose, prediction that it will be the strongest economy in the coming uh, decades. I think in 20 years time, I think some are suggesting that China will be number one, India number two, uh, U US number three, and uh, EU number four. And this, just coming back to the um, language of unilateralism coming from uh, US, uh, is also complemented by a frustration with the US uh, in terms of Europe's coherence on its approach to defense and security, and a sense that um, some, if not many, uh, European states are free riding in terms of the investment and defense of others. And I, and I put Ireland into that category at number 27 of 27 in terms of investment in defense and security. I've said it many times. What do we know that the other 26 don't know if they're willing to pay more for defense and security in the EU? There is also, I think, and this is probably an interesting piece, is the growing desire of the European Union to learn the language of power. Now, many analysts will say that it doesn't have a strategic culture um, to, to learn that language of power, nor does it have the capabilities. But we see initiatives such as permanent, permanent structured cooperation 
we see European Defence Fund and we see the uh, annual review defence mechanism that is there. Um, but there is this issue whether Europe can learn the language of power or not is dependent on other areas. And I think perhaps the most significant is the um, energy dependency that Europe currently experiences. It is absolutely dependent on uh, imported energy. And for instance, it's dependent on 40% of its LNG from Russia. I think about 30% of its crude imports from Russia. And that's driving fragmentation at this moment in the context of as Russia flexes its, its muscles. We have the uncertainty of a uh, climate breakdown and the penalty associated with that. And uh, I think we have other sectors as well, um, such as we've seen in the last week, uh, Russia's indication of an exercise in Ireland's exclusive economic zone, five days of a, an area which is roughly 5,000 square kilometers, the size of Waterford, Wicklow and Dublin, in which uh, Russia said it was going to come into a sovereign state and carry out a live firing and a, a rocket exercise, unprecedented, provocative and unacceptable. Just looking to the future, I see a few drivers, obviously, and um, I mentioned the rise of China, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and, and how we position in that, we see the activities of Russia. For Russia to become stronger, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to become physically stronger, all it has to signal is make uh, Europe uh, look weaker. Um, we have the complexity of the security environment I've mentioned. Um, I think Africa is something that we all need to be conscious about. A growing population clusters, irregular migration, and um, this uh, difficulty in terms of the penalty of climate breakdown and what that will mean in the context of our uh, desire for carbon neutrality by 2050. But this all hinges back in an area that I think, Dan, we spoke about briefly just as we came on here, was the issue of European desire for strategic autonomy. Can it achieve that? Because without the language of power, without the ability to speak with the language of power, it will become more and more an unfair in the context of the um, world affairs and then find itself increasingly marginalised. I'll leave it at that. Many thanks for that, uh, uh, Mark. Just a quick follow-up uh, question to, 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 to you. Um, what do you attribute the Russian change of plan to uh, at the weekend? I, I think uh, Russia is just playing, uh, sending a signal. Uh, it, it sent a signal that it could do this. Uh, that signal was heard, heard by everybody. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it did it or it didn't do it. The fact that it had the audacity and the power to speak with that language. Uh, and I think the, the other piece was a, a broader signal that it could envelop uh, the, it could envelop Europe. It could have activities on our eastern frontier in Ukraine and simultaneously uh, an exercise on our western uh, uh, border in the Northeast Atlantic. And that basically is a capacity to, to actually uh, be active throughout the 27 uh, EU states, uh, as well as I think showing um, what and how, I suppose, isolated uh, Ireland is uh, post-Brexit. We are, as I've described, as a lone sentinel in the Atlantic, separated from the rest of the European Union. So it, it was a signal, and I, you know, and I think that was the important piece. The signal was more important than the actual activity. Great. Okay, uh, and just remind viewers that they feel free to put the questions that they that come to mind at any time using the Q and A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So from Cork to London, uh, Ulrika, welcome uh, to the event and uh, welcome back to the IIEA, and look forward to to your perspective from London and German uh, German perspective. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so I'm speaking uh, from from London, but I think I'm. Um, primarily here to talk about the, the kind of continental European or kind of EU view and the German view. And I, I thought I'll just kick us off with kind of two main points or observations, which are relatively uh, general, if you like, and I'm sure there are kind of specific questions about both um, specific countries' position at the moment um, and the, the kind of current challenge with Russia and that we can go into when it comes to, um, when we come to the Q&A. So yeah, so the, the first observation I wanted to share with you, and it is very much in line with what you just heard um, Mark saying, and that's that I, 
I do worry that that Europe or rather the European Union really has a problem to recognize the geopolitics and power politics and power political struggles are back and we struggle to find a common position. Um, the thing is, what, what we need to realize is that the European Union, for better or worse, really hasn't been made for this. Um, it hasn't been made for kind of geopolitics and, and power politics. In fact, it's kind of been made for the opposite. It, the idea was to create EU so that inner European political, power political struggles could be overcome. And the EU was brilliant um, in, in that regard. We don't have kind of power competition between France and Germany um, anymore to speak of. But it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't designed um, for uh, to be a geopolitical actor um, in its own right with regard to others. And it wasn't designed as a, as a foreign policy actor. Um, it also just benefited massively from the United States kind of you know, shielding it from a lot of problems and, and yeah, uh, security issues in particular for the last 30 years um, or so. And so I think it's really not, kind of not in the DNA of, of, of Europe. Um, in fact, it's the opposite of the DNA of, of the European Union to um, address issues in this, in this mindset. And we have these 27 countries uh, with very different um, approaches. And I must admit, as fascinating as I personally find neutral and non-aligned states, um, I, I do also worry mid, medium to long-term how the kind of, um, it's, it's six kind of special status states, if you count in Denmark, which is neutral, but has an opt out of European defense, um, how these six states within the European Union will kind of position itself um, within a European Union that, it, it, that, it, that is at least trying to become more of a geopolitical and indeed a kind of um, defense and security actor. Um, which indeed is kind of the second um, part of, of, of my point on the European Union. So I said, you know, it hasn't been designed for this. Um, so this all looks bleak. But at the same time, there is definitely some movement. Um, there's definitely some effort of changing this. You've all heard the speeches about the Geopolitical Commission, um, European Strategic Sovereignty or European Strategic Autonomy. We have the Strategic Compass that is currently being um, uh, being prepared, this kind of fundamental document that is trying to bring the views of the 27 together and come up with a more coherent foreign policy strategy. So within the EU, there is definitely a, a kind of a realization that, that more needs to be done. Um, but, you know, this is, this is going slowly. And I say this as someone who was kind of, you know, positive and, and, and optimistic when it came to that. But, but it's going rather slowly and the challenges are, are now. And just to reiterate a point, I thought that was really important with what Mark said about the kind of loss in relative power. Um, my, my colleague, Jeremy Shapiro, just had out a piece that I thought was really eye-opening. And I say this as someone who works in this field um, because he just looked at the kind of power balance uh, between the United States and, and Europe, United States and EU plus um, the United Kingdom over the last 10 or 20 years or so. And he really showed, you know, how Europe is losing its power in every sense of the word, world, word, sorry. So it's not just kind of defense and security, which we're all aware we are the biggest power, but also economic power. Since 2008, you know, relatively speaking, Europe has really lost economic power. And it just shows that, you know, we are, we are getting weaker. Um, at the same time, we're trying to do more and the challenges are becoming bigger. And that's a kind of, you know, dangerous um, combination. I also wanted to briefly touch upon um, Germany just because, or mainly because over the last week or the last two weeks, the world, I want to say, or allies have been really incredibly critical when it comes to German foreign policy um, in, in the context of the Russia-Ukraine-NATO conflict. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm critical um, of the German foreign policy too. But I must say that for Germany watchers, none of what this current government has been doing so far should come as a surprise. Because if you like, there are kind of three central tenets to um, German foreign policy. The first is that, you know, the diplomacy, communication, um, and international law is key. This is really where all international disputes should be solved or how all this international disputes should be solved. You should always keep open um, communication channels and, and 
this is this is really kind of the one solution uh, to everything. The second tenet of, of German foreign policy is the importance of the economy and economic relations and trade relations. Um, in the German mindset, this kind of matters more than anything. Um, if you have good trade relations, you're unlikely to, to go into, um, into conflict. So having trade relations, having um, links to other countries, having gas pipelines to uh, potential opponents is a way of keeping kind of communication channels open. And this really is a, is a general belief. Um, and it is seen as, as mattering more than, you know, defense capabilities. In fact, I thought that there was a really great um, poll. I mean, there are 62% of Germans who say that in international crises, economic power is more important than military power. So even in the context of an international crisis, the economic power trumps military power by, you know, massively, it's a big um, a majority. And then the third kind of tenet of, of um, German foreign policy is that the military and yeah, all things military are evil and wrong and, and not even really a, a, a possibility of, or, of last resort or a mean of last resort, but just kind of generally um, not something that, that we should be working with and that we should be uh, thinking um, uh, of. I mean, again, just to throw out another um, poll that I thought was really quite striking. Only 24% of Germans say that under some conditions, war can sometimes be necessary to achieve justice, while over half, 51%, say that war is never necessary. And again, like this is this was really formulated in the most kind of in the broadest way possible of saying no, under some circumstances, to achieve justice, maybe in some context. And most Germans say no, never. Um, and I think this is also something that we're currently seeing with um, with regard to Russia. So, so yeah, just you know, I, I've been I've been playing this role of kind of Germany explainer um, uh, in in the recent weeks, and and thought that maybe that was helpful for your your audience um, as well. And just as a kind of last sentence, because that's also something I've been thinking about um, quite a bit when it comes to Germany. In a way, I mean, I said that with the European Union, the this kind of rejection or, or let's call it ignorance of great power politics is maybe too slowly, but still maybe changing or there are efforts of changing that. In Germany, I'm not so sure because I worry that the next generation of thinkers and, and people and, and foreign policy makers is almost worse, pre worse prepared um, when it comes to these challenges. And the main reason of, for that is that not only did we grow up in this mindset that I just um, described, but we also grew up in kind of 30 years or so um, of extreme geopolitical calm and geopolitical peace. So the whole time, basically after 1989 and after, 19, uh, after 1990, um, the end of the Soviet Union, we had roughly 30 years of you know, geopolitical calm, geopolitical peace were completely shielded from the, 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 the geopolitical competition um, that I would argue is actually the more normal situation. And so we really struggle just to understand what's happening uh, now. And so, you know, I look at, at Russia, I look at actually what is the bigger challenge, which is the rise of China and China becoming this more dominant actor. And I, and I, and I really do worry, I mean, both about Germany um, as the strongest country in the EU and the EU um, uh, in and it of itself. And um, yeah, I, I don't quite, I, I, I am aware that I've basically described um, uh, problems rather than, than given solutions in a way the only solution I can really come up with is to kind of keep talking, keep challenging our own convictions and our own mindsets and kind of looking at the world as it is and then realizing that the realities unfortunately don't conform to what we would like the world to look like. Um, I very much sympathize with everyone who says there shouldn't be any military confrontation. We should live in a world where everything is done through international law and international organizations. And I'm, I'm, I'm all for these things. It's just that it doesn't seem to fit with the current realities. And um, I think this is something we definitely need to discuss more in, in Brussels, in Berlin, and I guess also um, in Ireland. Thanks. And, and, and one that I'll definitely want to, to ask all of you, but Ulrike, while, while, it, while you're there and it comes to mind, the, the escalation of the situation uh, between Russia and Ukraine, or more specifically Russia, to what do you attribute that? Could the change of chancellor in Germany be part of it? I know trying to understand the, the SPD's 
views on Russia are, can be particularly complicated, but they, there's a certain sympathy towards Russia in the, in the SPD that may be stronger than other parties. Is that correct? Uh, is, is the change of chancellor one factor or any other factors that, that you'd care to mention in terms of that escalation? Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of why now question, right? Um, I, so I, I think that maybe on the tactical level, uh, Vladimir Putin is looking at these elements, you know, a new government in uh, Germany and indeed a three party government, Merkel has left, um, I'll get to the SPD in a second, but it is true that they have their own kind of Russia problems. Um, we have the election campaign in, in France. Um, we have the whole Brexit situation, which kind of um, weakens uh, uh, Europe. We have in London the, the internal domestic um, uh, issues, although I have to say that the Johnson government has been able to kind of overcome those and, you know, while still doing quite... Um, a quite coherent, uh, but still pursuing a quite coherent foreign policy on Russia, I would say. Um, we have in Sweden, you know, men minority government, um, very weak. There's also um, elections coming up. So you have all these elements and maybe on a tactical level, um, uh, this, this kind of influences uh, Putin's thinking to some extent, it's, it's kind of hard for me to tell. But I think on the, on, on the, on the kind of more strategic level, I don't think this matters Massively, I think in the end, it really is um, the fact that, that that Vladimir Putin wants a different security architecture and security situation in Europe. He's not happy with what we currently have. Um, the way I understand it, he wants Ukraine to be within the sphere of influence, um, very clearly in the, in, under the influence of, of uh, uh, Russia. And so I think, you know, yes, it would be better if, we had a very strong government and a very strong chancellor at the moment in, in Germany. If um, uh, in, in the US, the situation was different in, in you know, all kinds of places, there could be a be better situation, but I don't think this is um, particularly um, uh, important. And just one sentence on the SPD, because you asked this specifically. So, so the Social Democrats, so we have a three party coalition in Germany now, um, and the Social Democrats lead this uh, coalition. Um, and then Olaf Scholz is, is the new chancellor. And he has been very absent from the, cur the current Russia crisis. Very interesting. He left a lot of room to the foreign minister from the, from the Greens. He's actually giving an interview on this tonight. So I'm, I'm very curious what he's going to say. It's true that his party struggles with the relationship to Russia. Um, there are more so-called Putin, Pesteya, Putin understanders in his party than I would like. Um, this is the party that kind of started Nord Stream 2 and everything that, you know, that entails. Um, that being said, again, I don't, I don't think that that is, it, it, it's, not, it's not decisive. It's part of the mute music. It makes everything more difficult. Um, for, this currently, for this current new coalition, the situation is tricky because Russia is one of the things where, um, you know, between the three, the three parties, there really are differences in, in view. Um, you know, one party actually wanted to end Nord Stream 2 completely, like, you know, things like that. So it's, it's not, it's, it's definitely a big foreign policy challenge for this government. And they would have preferred to not deal with this so early in their, um, in their time in office. But yeah, it is what it is. And, and um, in the end, it's, it's part of the puzzle, but it's not decisive, I'd, I'd put it. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, from London, uh, we go to Washington. Uh, Tom, you're again, welcome back to the Institute and the floor is yours. Thanks, Dan, and it's great to, to be with you all. Um, so I, I just start, I just want to make three points, but I just start where Ulrika left off, you know, and I, I'm with the question of why now. I think another way to ask the question is, you know, why not now? I mean, this uh, has been a long standing grievance and I would say ambition of, of Putin, you know, not just uh, the, the drift of, as he sees it, of Ukraine, you know, to the West, not just interacting with NATO, but also obviously back in 2013, you know, with the EU, the fact that his own actions have turned the Ukrainian people more away from Russia, made them more skeptical, much more skeptical and even hostile toward Moscow and more open you know, to the West. So there's a piece of that there. There's a piece of his uh, frustration and opposition to European security architecture, what 
Timothy Garden asked the other day, sort of identified as the Helsinki sort of approach that Europe is composed of independent sovereign countries with equal rights, and he has more of a sphere of influence model in mind. Um, there's uh, his sense, perhaps, that as the U.S. attention is focused on Asia, that maybe that creates, you know, a bit of an opening. And let's not forget that, you know, this year is a 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union and something he called uh, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And that is something, you know, he has wanted to reverse um, in some way. So I think that we don't need to look very far. I think there are questions about tactical and timing, you know, and the like, but I think it's a broader scope of ambition. You know, he's 69 years old. He's been in power for 21, it's 21, 22 years now. If he's going to um, accomplish this as he perceives it, um, he probably needs to do that in the relative near term. Right. This isn't something he can come back to in 10 years. It's probably not something he would trust to give to a future Russian leader who he would not think is as capable um, as, as he is. Um, so I think it's, you know, it is a break, though, with the past. It is not just business as usual, you know, for Putin. They have never taken the number of troops that they've taken from the Far East and put them you know, on their on 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 their border with Ukraine before, um, they've never had, a, they've never abandoned um, the deniability um, that they've maintained in the past to the extent uh, that they have on this occasion. Right? Remember the little little green men of 2014. We're not in that world, you know, anymore. So this is a force, you know, built up to invade and occupy at least the eastern part of Ukraine. It's a force designed you know, to topple um, the government. Um, it is, I think, unprecedented really in Europe um, in the post-Cold War world. And I think it is about the type of world that we're going to sort of live in, you know, in the future. So I think this is a very significant crisis. I think if there is a, if there is a full-scale invasion, I think that could, you know, destabilize, you know, Europe in really profound ways. And I worry a lot about it sort of dragging in you know, other actors and having a sort of contagion effect, not in terms of Russia continuing to, to invade other countries, but more, you know, of the type of um, destabilization that we've seen in the Middle East, you know, with, with, with Syria. Just if you have a, a conflict of that scale, uh, things are going to happen, I think, that are negative. Um, and it's obviously more broadly a part of, you know, his a near sort of revolutionary view, I think now that something fundamental has to change in the European security architecture and our desire to, to basically keep things roughly the way they were with some enhanced consultation and enhanced multilateralism of Russia. But, you know, there's very little appetite, I think, in the rest of Europe for sort of a Yalta spheres of influence type system. So I think that's sort of where we are. Um, just a word on the U.S. Um, role. You know, it's interesting that uh, th this administration came in, I think, focused on issues other than Russia, like one could have imagined them coming in, wanting revenge for the election interference in 2016, you know, very focused on, on, on Putin. They did not do that. They came in uh, really making China and foreign policy for the middle class their top um, priorities. I think they wanted a stable and predictable relationship with Russia, you know, as they put it. Um, what, why that is important, I think, um, is that when they began to sound the alarm bell in November about the threat of an invasion, this wasn't something they were looking for, right? This is not a repeat of 2003, where in some ways it was confirmation bias, like they were going out and cherry picking intelligence to conform to a policy that they already had. Um, they're quite the opposite, in fact, they did not I, I think, you know, uh, this was not part of their, you know, overall um, sort of foreign policy sort of to confront Russia, you know, over Ukraine. And um, that, I think, you know, gave them sort of a, a, a bit of a, a extra credibility, you know, in this regard. And they did manage, I think, to convince uh, European allies of the sort of gravity of the threat. I think that did catch Putin by surprise. I think he thought he would have more time he thought that the West would be more divided and perhaps than it was. Um, and they, I think, have done a pretty good job of, 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 of remaining sort of focused and making this 
sort of a key priority. Um, so I think in terms of the pivot to Asia, you know, there definitely is, uh, you know, a rebalance over the longer term. But this is really a reminder, you know, that the U.S., especially on something as fundamental as a major conflict, you know, in the middle of, or, you know, at the heart of Europe, that this is something that the U.S. will have a continued role on. I think the United States would like to see Europe play a bigger role, would be very supportive of the EU doing that. But right now, there's really very little substitute for sort of U.S. leadership on it. Like Germany wants the U.S. to lead. Uh, others, you know, Eastern Europeans want the U.S. to lead. Macron, I think, envisages a large role for Europe, but recognizes, I think, that there's not, um, that it's not really possible in the way he would like you know, at this moment. So I think we are seeing, you know, that sort of traditional US role play out. Finally, Dan, I would just say a few words about what to do. I mean, I, I think as a base case right now, an invasion is probably the most likely outcome. Um, I just think everything is sort of pointing there. Uh, you know, one could say it's a bluff and the hard thing about distinguishing a bluff from the real thing is that there's really nothing, no evidence that could emerge um, that would falsify the bluff hypothesis short of Russia actually invading, right? Because you could say, well, everything they're doing is just making that threat more credible. Um, but I think when we're looking at sort of the granular, you know, details and the rhetoric, um, I, I think that's the most likely, you know, outcome, um, probably sort of 50, you know, just sort of probably north of 50% probability. Um, there's a couple of things missing. I think the pretext is missing. We haven't yet seen from Moscow, you know, the short-term justification for why the talks have failed, that could happen very, very quickly. So that's one big thing um, to watch. Um, but I think our sort of task is to try to figure out how to dissuade him from doing this, right? How do we prevent him from going down this route? And I think there are sort of three sort of pillars to the strategy, and I'll just very briefly, you know, mention them. The first is I think there needs to be a reframing of this entire crisis so it's not just about NATO uh, relations with Ukraine and NATO expansion or even European security architecture. And it is about the right of Ukraine to exist as a sovereign country. You know, the, the, the fundamental principles in the UN Charter, um, the principles regarding, you know, how countries, you know, preventing countries from acquiring new territory or, 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 or annexing other um, territory. So I think that is important because it is about that. I think, and also I think that's less fertile ground for Putin, right, than Putin's actions that he's threatening would be a, a fundamental violation of the UN Charter. There would be a real radical change in international um, relations. And that I think is something harder for him to defend than, you know, this is a dispute about NATO's sort of relations with Ukraine. So that I think is the first piece of it. The second piece is to try to convince him that if he takes his path, He's irreversibly damaging his own security environment as he perceives it, right? So if he chooses, you know, the, the invasion option, things will be much worse for, for his security interests. And the announcement today from the, you know, U.S. Department of Defense that there will be a, re, a, a deployment of troops, additional troops to Romania, you know, and to Poland as a part of that. Finland possibly joining NATO as a part of that. Um, the, the, the talk about possibly arming an insurgency is a piece of that. The economic sanctions piece, obviously, is a piece of that. The technological export controls, another element on, on, on chips. So I think all of those together could sort of paint a picture, you know, that um, he will be damaging his own interests if he does this. And then the final piece, which is very important as well, is the diplomatic track, you know, to have a really sincere, um, substantive diplomatic you know, um, element that provides off ramps if he would like to avail of them. And I think the administration and the European allies have done a pretty good job of, of outlining that um, within the red lines that they have. So, you know, not no sort of major sort of changes in terms of a transition to a spheres of influence system. But yes, the recognition that if Russia wants a conversation about how to you know, uh, about changes and reforms to European security architecture. Uh, that's something, uh, you know, that the, that, um, the US and its allies will engage in um, if they want to reinvigorate the conventional forces in Europe treaty or have uh, inspections on a reciprocal basis of missile sites and the like. 
or guarantees about no missiles in certain places, and again, on a reciprocal basis, that is a conversation we can engage in. So I think having that, uh, and that is something more, I think, that the, the, than they have had before, like a real uh, substantive negotiation um, in a relatively compressed period of time. So let's say a year, 18 months, uh, rather than having it going on forever um, with, no real, with no real outcome. So I think if you package all of those together, Dan, you know, if you have the, 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 the reframing to make it a little more difficult for him to do this in the court of global public opinion, you have the, um, the high costs that will be imposed if you were to do this, and then you have the, um, the, the off-ramp part where there's a real um, uh, diplomatic option. Um, it's possible he may be dissuaded from doing it. He may still do it, in which case then, you know, we're in a very different world, I think, the day after. Um, but I think it will be such a catastrophe that is worth sort of going big and all three tracks now to try to uh, change his incentive structure. I'll, I'll finish up. Yeah. Good. And I, I suppose one of the questions we have is, is the landing zone, diplomatic landing zone for, for this issue. I think you, you covered, covered it well there. Might come to both of the speakers on that one. A uh, couple of other questions, which I'll put now that we've got. But Tom, I... Uh, um, Mark's earlier point about Ireland's specific position and uh, the free riding issue, um, is it one you agree with and how is it perceived, if at all, uh, on that side of the Atlantic? Is it simply that we're just too small and not, not, not sig significant enough for people to really worry and they say, okay, somebody wants to free ride, if they're so small, that's okay? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I, in all truth, I don't think it's sort of, you know, high up on the agenda in terms of the US wanting, you know, wanting sort of Ireland to change its position. I think, you know, the view similarly with, with Finland and Sweden as well is, you know, if if a country just changes its mind and wants a closer relationship, the, the US would engage with that. I don't think anyone's trying to sort of force or, you know, or pressure anyone into it. I would just say though, on the, you know, the neutrality debate obviously is a long standing debate. People are very, uh, you know, strong um, sort of feelings about it. I, I think rather than, you know, discussing sort of the principles of it, I think one alternative way to, to sort of approach the, the discussion is to say, you know, what problems does Ireland have in the security domain, maybe that it didn't have before? And then what are the options to sort of solve that, right? So on um, cyber crime and, and cyber attacks, that's clearly a problem. There needs to be a way to sort of deal with that. You know, perhaps on having some surveillance mechanism in the maritime domain, you know, to have more, you know, information flow about what Russia or others might do. Maybe that's another element. And so, what are the, you know, what are the options to try to to try to address those, um, especially in the technological sphere, which of course Ireland has a huge, um, you know, is a huge part of now. And and you know, maybe that can be done without a fundamental change in in doctrine. Right, maybe it can be done in, you know, in, in other in other ways. But I think looking at it as a problem solving, you know, exercise um, will be sort of a good, you know, a, a, maybe a, a a way of actually dealing with the challenges that are there, you know, uh, while while avoiding some of those pretty, you know, divisive discussions. I, I don't think there's a huge appetite for sort of fundamentally changing you know, ch changing the overall, the, the country's overall sort of foreign policy worldview. Probably not politically achievable at the moment anyway. Um, Mark, maybe come to you with two questions from the audience. Jim Deary asks, how should Ireland contribute to European defence? What military defence capacities, capabilities should we be investing in? And a second one aimed at you, Mark, from John Bigger. Ireland has tended to argue that the main purpose of the EU's common security and defence policy is to provide the capability for out of area peace, peace, peace building and peacekeeping operations. Some others would prefer to develop capabilities for the defence of the EU. Do you consider the recent develop, that recent developments should prompt us to reconsider our approach? I think it's, a, it's very timely questions, and I think the Commission on Defence Forces is, is about to um, submit its report, but we have traditionally uh, prioritised, I think, our commitment to uh, the United Nations and our uh, almost 70,000 members of our Defence Forces who have served in various missions in the last 60 plus years. Um, but the reality is that we are shifting in the context of a greater understanding 
of our sovereign domain. And there are five dimensions to that. There is our land, there is our air, and there is our maritime, but there is also space and there is cyber. And uh, our capabilities in the, in the latter two are, are very weak. In fact, on space, I think it, it almost insignificant. And yet a sovereign state is actually responsible for any activities in the space domain generated within its jurisdiction. So you can't ignore that. And I think that's somewhere that um, I hope the commission will look at. In the maritime side, we're, we're significantly weaker than uh, would be traditionally expected of a maritime state. We don't have a subsurface uh, surveillance capacity. And yet, you know, two dimensions that we know have been in the news in recent past, uh, the issue of submarine activity and submarine cables. And uh, the, the, the idea of critical national infrastructure and actually addressing those means there are capability requirements if we're to be able to deal with those. And the cyber piece, I think, was on the news today. The idea of us actually um, uh, you know, grappling with that in a, in a cross-government manner, uh, that is something, uh, I think, in the context of our reputation, our dependency on FDI and foreign direct investment, and our ability to actually to have a more robust uh, cyber defense infrastructure in the state. We've seen the penalty in terms of the spider, the attack on uh, the HSE, and, and uh, we can expect to see more of that. Uh, and I suppose, but overall in the context of investment on defense, Ireland is number 27 of number 27 in EU uh, investment in defense. I asked the question, what do we know that the other 26 don't know to give them a sense of uh, feeling they need to invest more? Ultimately, investment in defense is about your insurance premium. premium. Sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imagined than real. And we've seen uh, the vulnerability of our sovereign rights in terms of a maritime domain, where effectively uh, the Russian Federation was able to declare it was going to annex 5,000 square kilometers of Irish sovereign jurisdiction, where we have sovereign rights, I should say, uh, for five days. That's unprecedented. So I, I think there's been a, a wake up call. Uh, the HRBP has said in the past the alarm bells are ringing and uh, Europe needs to learn the language of power. Well, it can only learn the language of power if it actually changes uh, towards a strategic culture. And it also must acquire capabilities that it doesn't have already within the 27. And it doesn't mean replication and duplication with NATO. I think there's complementarity with NATO. The Brussels effect is actually a powerful capability in itself. So what, what Europe can bring in the EU together with NATO and the integrated approach is a palette of options in terms of the application of power. That's what the coherency we need. And I know some people will feel it's a long and slow road, but it has to start somewhere. The uh, global strategy is the journey, it's mapped it out. Strategic Compass has done the, if you like, the intelligence assessment. We now need to look at the capability enablers that will allow the EU to be able to stand up and actually utilize power in an effective manner. Thanks, Mark. Ulrike, we've got a couple of questions uh, that I might put to you. One from Cahill Brewer. Uh, he talks about, he's a number of questions, but let me just put one aspect. Uh, he talks about the U UN, uh, United Nations, the Security Council, and he wonders whether the uh, power of veto, the PIF, the permanent five members have, uh, has that lived its usefulness or could even be a barrier to improving global peace and security? That's one. And then sort of more specific, coming back to the Ukraine situation, Bill Emmett uh, asks what kind of landing zone there could be for a diplomatic compromise. He, he also does mention, I think it's worth, worth saying, that uh, um, the, the falling apart of Yugoslavia in the 1990s led to 140,000 deaths. Um, and that Europe, EU officials at the time said it was Europe's moment, and it turned out not to be. He, he makes a point which I think is, uh, is, is certainly worth making in terms of conflict in Europe in the post-Second World War era. So maybe, uh, Ulrike, UN, a relevance on what sort of landing zone there could be for a diplomatic compromise in UN, um, Ukraine? Right, so the easiest questions. Um, I mean, very, very little to, to add on, on the United Nations, I think. I mean, in a way, the UN and the UN Security Council, I mean, it works as it was designed. Um, I think there's very little point in kind of complaining about veto power since, you know, that's how it was supposed to, to work. Um, but, but to be honest, I mean, the UN just hasn't been playing a really important um, role. I mean, certainly not in, in the current context, uh, the current conflict that we're seeing. Um, so... <sighs> I mean, especially Germans would love to, to see the UN as this kind of place where 
all um, uh, kind of differences and in interests and all conflicts get resolved, but it isn't. And it, it certainly is particularly difficult when we're talking about conflicts between the veto powers. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have a good good answer to that other than that's probably not the place where this uh, will be done and, and, and can be done. On the landing zone, <sighs> I, I worry about this because I don't, so I thought it was really interesting what, what, what Thomas said. And um, yeah, I, I kind of refer to, 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 to his ideas and we've just had the kind of leaked answer from the US to the, to the Russian demands um, that seemed quite reasonable. But I mean, it, re it really depends on what, what Putin really wants. If he genuinely wants to change the European security architecture, and he basically wants to move from a kind of Helsinki Paris idea of, you know, where, where countries are free to decide who to align with and who not to align with and, and are sovereign, etc., to a more kind of Yalta model of um, uh, spheres of influence and, and the big powers being able to tell others um, what they can and cannot do. That's unacceptable for for Europe, or you know, it really should be unacceptable for for Europe and NATO. So, if that's his demand, I don't think there's a landing zone somewhere between that. Um, like, like that just doesn't work. Um, the same with this idea of you know withdrawing um, all troops from from NATO members, kind of back to the borders of 1997. These kind of things that it, Putin's demands were very maximalist, um, and so. If that's what he really wants, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of compromise there. Um, if you know, if this is about engagement, um, arms control, um, respect, as as unclear as it is what, what that's exactly means, if he basically just wanted to reassert his the importance of Russia on the European continent, wanted to be at eye level with with Joe Biden, all of this, and um, which he's largely gotten. Um, and if his goal in the end was to undermine um, European and NATO unity, I think he's also already achieved that, which we are ourselves to blame, by the way. But but I think you know this may have been part of his his calculation as well. If 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 that's if that's that, maybe it will be enough to kind of come up with some kind of um, yeah means of communication and arms control, etc. But I. I, I really struggle with coming up with a landing zone where I say, okay, this this may, this is acceptable from the European side, and I think it's acceptable from the Russian side. So unfortunately, I'm quite I'm quite pessimistic um, pessimistic on that. And just a, just a um, point on on Yugoslavia because I saw this in the comments, and and of course, I mean, no one is saying that nothing has happened between since 1989, and there has been peace in the world. I mean, that's not the point, or, or even peace in Europe. My point and, and the point of others who have made this um, observation is that we've had a period of, of kind of geopolitical calm where we just didn't have these kind of big tectonic shapes of you know one one power coming up, the other power coming down. Like that's that's the point. It's not as if there was complete peace and, and no conflicts whatsoever. So we also had 9-11, um, we had the terrorist attacks all over um, uh, the Western world. You know, there there were a lot of um, uh, wars, of course, going on. Um, so, so just to be just to be clear on on that, but um, we we didn't have we didn't have this experience of you know kind of yeah tectonic changes in the geopolitical um, landscape, and I think that's what's kind of missing in our in in our I mean my generation's um, experience. Mark, I think you wanted to just come in on that particular point. Yeah, and Ulrike, thanks for answering that question. I saw it there myself, and I wasn't making the point. You know, I, I think my, our point is notwithstanding the Balkan Wars and the reality, they were a terrible tragedy. Uh, and uh, but the reality is that the European Union has been good in terms of peace, and uh, the institutions have delivered a significant amount in that area. But things are changing now, and uh, we now need to remodel how we're going to move forward. And um, I know neutrality has been mentioned in terms of one of the questions there, and uh, I, I think we, we could spend the whole debate on dealing with neutrality, but I'm always taken by um, um, Gareth Fitzgerald's piece, I think he published in the Times in 1999, it's online if anybody wants to read it, about the, the myth of neutrality, and I, I think he lays it pretty bare there in terms of what we see and suggest is a principle of neutrality in Ireland actually is a happenstance, 
it's an accident. You know, and, and in reality, I think the institutions within the EU give us an opportunity to look at how we move forward in the context of the future. Uh, and I do think Strategic Compass, uh, the, um, the Global Strategy, uh, PESCO, CARD, uh, they all point us in a direction whereby there's going to have to be um, a mutuality and a multilateralism in terms of how we develop capabilities within the EU. And we have to do that with a, an eye on how our relationship with NATO also develops. So there's a journey there, uh, and nobody's saying it's going to be perfect. And some could be pessimistic about it, but we actually have no option but to, to move along that journey. And I think the final point is there are, I suppose, dormant uh, articles there in terms of sol solidarity and mutual assistance. And we have to see how they play out into the future. They're enablers. And um, you know, this is a, a, a world whereby no individual state within the uh, EU or in Europe can uphold its sovereignty on its own. That's a fact. So it's about um, multilateralism, it's about mutuality, and it's about solidarity. And I think those discussions have to be had. Thanks, Mark. Just a comment from Alan Dukes, uh, a longstanding member, of course, of the Institute. I just let me quote him, Putin should be told that the era of consolidating, quote, spheres of influence died with the death of empires. That's Alan's view. Um, but it didn't. Like okay. this is this is I mean I think this is exactly the problem. I very I share the sentiment. Like we have this, I, I know this so well from Germany and from all over Europe. We definitely have this idea of like you know this is all in the past and this is obsolete and this whole kind of great power politics and and, and you know military confrontations and all of this. You know this is clearly you know so last century. The problem is just that you know we may have moved on, but maybe the others didn't. And so I again I very much sympathize with this idea of you know. Haven't we gone past this? And isn't isn't this yeah um, um, obsolete? And aren't we more enlightened than that? But if you're the only kind of enlightened and whatever entity and have moved on, and everyone else hasn't, then you still have to deal with the world as it is, then rather than you you um, you want it to be. And that's exactly the challenge. Thank you. Um, let me see, Donald of Rollercorn, I suppose I'll come back to you in a moment, Ulrike, but I'm going to go to Tom. He has two questions. One, which I think you'd be probably best qualified to answer, Ulrike, in terms of German investment into Russia post-89, and has that affected the interests of Germany vis-a-vis -vis Russia? His other question is directed towards you, Tom, and let me see if I can bring it up. He picks you up on, on the fact that you mentioned um, uh, Putin's age, uh, 69, uh, and he wonders, does, does his age actually mean he doesn't care about world opinion, that he's actually more interested in, uh, in advancing his own agenda domestically, something of an extraction, and also his, his views, as Donald mentions, in his sort of greater ruse, the stuff he's been writing about, which is available uh, online, Putin's own words, uh, in, in terms of uh, Russian history and where, where what constitutes a core of Russian civilization. Do you want me to start out? Yeah, Dan, um, yeah I mean, I do think that is a, you know, a, a, a thing with him. I mean, if you just think of it sort of, you know, this way, he's been, he's in, been in power more or less for over, you know, two decades. I think he feels like he is the measure of his counterparts. Um, you know, he does, I think, have this long-standing ambition to reverse as much as possible the collapse of the Soviet Union. Ukraine has always had, uh, you know, a, a particular place in sort of Russian history. That's something he has most, you know, recently, obviously in July, in that now infamous, you know, article, um, essentially written about questioning whether or not um, Ukraine is really a country, you know, at all. So Ukraine is a big prize for him. It's a big prize for, you know, for Russian, you know, nationalism. I don't think he particularly cares about, you know, the court of global public opinion. I don't think he really cares about, uh, you know, the European reaction, um, as long as those costs are things he thinks he can manage. So I think he's willing to pay a very high price um, to accomplish what he wants. Whether or not that price is infinite, I think is the question we're going to figure out, right? And 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 so maybe the price can be made so high that he will be dissuaded from doing it. Um, but I, I don't think we need to go all that far to find an explanation, you know, for why he would do it. And just in terms of the diplomatic 
you know, landing pad. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of wriggle room. Um, the big question is whether or not he actually wants an off ramp or if he wants to go in and and take the whole, you know, to get the whole prize, as it were, from his perspective. You know, but, you know, the U.S. has already, you know, countries have already committed to Minsk, you know, too. There's differences in interpretation, obviously, but there is, you know, a previous commitment to that. There's, you know, Ukraine, there is an open door policy for NATO, but it's not as if Ukraine's about to join NATO at any time in the immediate future. So, you know, again, that's 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 something that's a, a bit ambiguous, or one would assume tailor-made uh, for diplomacy. Um, and there are the architectural questions, which I think is a substantive, you know, piece there. Um, I just don't think any of that is enough on its own, but I think we need the other components as well. A very quick follow-up, Tom. We only got a few minutes. Coordination between Russia and China on any, on all of this. Is there any going on? Very quickly. Yeah, yeah, there, there is some, but you know, I, I think the, the the Chinese have sort of expressed some sympathy for the Russian position. Putin is going to the Olympics, I guess, it, it soon. Um, uh, uh, so he he should be in uh, Beijing, um, but I don't think we're not going to see. I think you know real coordination and and material support. Uh, we will also won't see China doing anything to really try to stop Putin from doing it. So, you know, there are different interpretations about whether they really want it to happen. I, I expect they probably don't because it would bring, you know, a lot of heat down. But um, they're going to let him do his thing, I think, and give him some rhetorical backing. OK, Ulrich, Ulrich at that point about uh, Germany's influence. And also, could I follow it up? That that issue about, you know, Germany was very prepared to sacrifice its its auto exports, which Brexiteers believed would be um, core in Russia, in Germany's position on Brexit. Um, it, how does that fit that Germany was prepared to put its strategic interests of European unity ahead of its commercial interests from Brexit? How does that fit with, with uh, Germany's broader policy towards Russia? Right, and that in two minutes. Okay, so number one, um, economic relationships between Russia and Germany have always been important. And by the way, not just after 89, um, even throughout you know, the Cold War, there were, for example, gas pipelines, um, very much with this idea of kind of keeping um, communications open between the, the East and the West. So yes, this matters. However, I'd say there's one element of this that matters more than everything else, and that's indeed the gas. Um, somewhere between 30 and 40% of German gas, gas come from Russia, and that's a real dependency. Um, and that's one that hurts because if there's an issue with these gas pipelines, Germans freeze and the economy goes down. Um, so that's a problem. The other economic links, as important as they are, Germany has shown since, 20, since 2014 that it is willing to forego these economic profits, because Germany has always been supportive of the EU sanctions, which it to a large extent carries, right? Like a lot of the elements that really hurt hurt the Germans here. So um, it's a bit of a mixed picture. It's, it's, there, is, are, there are dependencies that matter, but you know, it's not as if Germany is aligning in any way with Russia because of economic interests. Um, on Brexit, the Germans really care about the European Union, really. And they really think Brexit is a terrible idea. They are emotionally, um, they are reacting emotionally to that. And I'm not surprised that Germany was willing to um, sacrifice economic gain on that, be against on that issue. I'm not sure whether it's exactly the same on um, Russia. And the big question, the really big question, is going to be exports to China. Because here it really, really hurts. If the Germans, can't export to China anymore if you know we're talking about sanctions, et cetera. That's going to be a big issue for the German uh, economy, much more than anything we've seen with regard to Russia. So that's really going to be the, the test case. OK, look, final question to, to you, Mark, um, bringing it back home. There's a question from Tom Connolly about spending on areas um, on EU defense projects. Um, not sure if that's correct, I'm sure it is. Um, but he says we are weak on all fronts, especially air and naval power. Russia is certainly aware of this. Should, would it not be more important to look after our own defense forces 
if we are neutral. Um, I'm not expert enough in exactly where yeah, the I, I think the point going. is, yeah, PESCO and uh, those type of projects are about common interests development, whereby the actual outcome is bigger than the sum of the parts. So we, we should not all be creating the same types of technology in silos. It's better to actually have a collaborative approach in terms of developing capabilities. There is, of course, then certain states that will have greater strength in, in other areas. And, and just if I could just take the opportunity we have to finish up with one point, I think Noel Dorr um, put a point in about Sun Tzu, and he said, right, uh, the issue, and, and it goes back to Ambassador Pan's point with regards to, he took us up on saying that Europe is weaker. It, it's not about Europe being weaker. It's about Europe being perceived to be relatively weaker than, than Russia. And that's what Russia is doing. It is actually able to exercise power and building on the, the point, I think that Ulrika raised there on energy, for as long as Europe is dependent on Russian gas and crude, we will be in a difficult position. So I think for the next couple of decades, we're going to have to follow Lindblom's muddling through to come to a point of truth. And the point I made on Sunday in the Sunday Times was we have a remarkable opportunity in Ireland in terms of offshore renewable energy, possibilities in terms of being able to actually mitigate that energy dependency. Thank you all uh, for joining us. My apologies, there are plenty of questions and points that, that were made by the audience that we just don't have time to get to, but uh, we've already gone a minute over, so apologies for that. But look, most of all, thanks to our three speakers for really giving uh, succinct and, uh, and rich comments on, on an evolving situation. And um, thanks again for joining us uh, again, all of you have been with us before. Look forward to having you back again. Thanks a lot, have a good afternoon to everyone.